Hello, folks. My name is John Murphy. Welcome to another edition of On the Home Front, a weekly magazine here on WILI. We're expanding our coverage now to include other channels in our region. We're covering Tallinn, Wyndham, and New London counties. Uh, we're going to be expanding to one hour beginning in August to allow more time for more stories. So right now we're focusing on local arts and culture, as we have for a long time. But beginning in August, we're going to stretch it out and uh, kind of cover a wider topic area that we used to do with On the Home Front. So each week, there'll be an art story. Each week we're going to have somebody from a new business in town or some entrepreneur. And then each week we'll have an organization like we're going to do today with these guys. And then we'll have unusual individuals, musicians, people in the area who have stories to share. So we'll have more time to get into this and have fun. The shows are here live on the radio now on WILI. They're recorded on video thanks to my co-producer Matt Rupar. So we have video. They're posted on YouTube on the WILI uh, channel along with some other shows that we have here. And this will also be running on the public access channel 192 Charter Spectrum. So we're trying to get these stories each week out to more people in more areas, and you're always invited to join in. So our program today will focus on arts training opportunities that begin this Friday, but here we're going to start out with the Connecticut Eastern Railroad Museum. It's been a while since I've had these folks on the show. COVID is ending. They're getting back to normal like all of us, and they're here to talk about their opening on May 7th. So we have Mark Granville here and Duke York. Welcome back to the studio and welcome back to uh, spring of 2022. Well, thank you, John. Thanks, John. <laughs> you bet. So let's start out right away with your plans for the day. Uh, the reopening is May 7th on a Saturday. And then I want to go over some history of what this thing really represents. You know, just beyond a nice opening day, there's some real history here. Uh, well, John, uh, you know, spring is breaking out all over in Willimantic. You bet. There's a lot of activity starting up, and the Train Museum is part of that. Traditionally, every year, uh, we have opened after the winter on the first Saturday of May, and then we stay open through October. Being an outdoor museum, we close during the winter. Well, of course, in 2020, we never opened for the season. And in 2021, we went right past the first Saturday in May and opened on July 3rd. This year, we're opening on our traditional opening day, the first Saturday of May. That's this coming Saturday. That's May a good 7th. sign. Yeah, it's a great sign. Yeah. So uh, as we always do, we try to have a lot of festivities going on down there for our opening day. We hope a lot of people will show up, have a good time take a train ride, enjoy the facilities, look at what we have, discuss some history, yeah. and maybe learn something. <laughs> you know, you can walk there from here. It's at 55 Bridge Street. And if you don't know exactly, if you're going to put it into any GPS search engines, just put in the actual street address, 55 Bridge Street. If you use their name, it'll take you to a nearby spot. But anyway, it's 10 to 4 this Saturday. Now, Duke, you were there kind of at the beginning when they uh, they nailed the first spike, so to speak. So to speak, so yeah. So to speak, we, right? So we, congratulations. You made well, it through the storm. We, <laughs> we did, yeah. We, yeah. Were, we were definitely nuts to try to start a railroad museum without any funding, without a sugar daddy. But we thought this town had great railroad history. And sure did. And we, we gave it a shot. We... Uh, we're of course thirty years younger then, and we could we could lay track, and and uh, we we started a museum, and and we've survived all these years, so we're glad to be here, and we're looking forward to Saturday. Absolutely. Now, when everything was pretty well quiet during the COVID uh, blackout, we'll call it or whatever, what kind of things were you working on behind the scenes or plans that now that things are opening up, as you move ahead into the next year? Where do you want to go? What kind of things are you looking to either add to the collection or improve? Things like that. All of those things you just mentioned. We are uh, a group of volunteers who are down there a couple of times a week uh, doing various restoration projects, maintenance projects. You know, some of the buildings we have, well, all of the buildings we have are very old. Oh, sure. And their last restoration was now going on 20, 30 years. 
So we're starting to find maintenance problems and we have to keep up with that, painting, etc., etc., new roofs, things like that. There's oh, yeah. always something to happening. Yeah. Also, you know, Mother Nature, the grounds, trees, maintenance of the property, the walkways, that's always an issue too, right? The leaves. Landscaping. Oh, oh, leaves oh, especially, leaves. We, right? we just finally got, got rid of all the leaves and we, we have a lot of Eastern students that come down on, on the weekends and help us rake leaves. They're, they're, oh, we're, Eastern, we're, huh? we're awfully glad to have them. Uh, and we give them a train ride or something or a pump car sure. ride, which they seem to like. Of course. And we're very grateful that those students come down and help us out because, you know, we got 12 acres of, of, of a museum down there that are, we got to get rid of the leaves somehow. So That's right. But 12 acres is a nice spread. Those pump cars, people have seen them in movies. They're a hoot to actually right. get on one. Right. That's Awful right. lot of people have said, yeah, I've always wanted to ride on one of these things. So yeah. we'll have the pump car out on yeah, Saturday. I feel like you know. Buster Keaton or something, you know? That's right. One of those. Uh, so something else. They have a Facebook page and a website, and they're being rebooted for the year after the opening. So you go to the Facebook page, they'll have pictures of the opening. Again, that's this Saturday, May 7th. Uh, and then, uh, like, the website's being rebuilt with more information. But where can volunteers help? What kind of skills do you need? And uh, I know volunteers offer what they can for time, but there's lots of different jobs. So what do people do? The museum has an extremely wide array of things that volunteers can contribute to the museum. Uh, they go to completely non-physical things like doing historical research, writing grants, that kind of thing, right. to heavy-duty construction, laying track, fixing buildings that are made of wood, fixing things that are made out of steel, and then everything in between. So, you know, if you want to make a contribution, there's absolutely something you can do, and you can make it as light or as heavy as you want. Right. And is it possible, is it fair for me to assume there's like a trade union thing where if, if you like working with metal but you're not sure exactly, you're comfortable, you can be trained and shown how to, how to help out so that it's useful? That kind of thing. Well, we some of it's real specialized. Well, yeah, we and yeah. we've been very lucky in that regard. We we have uh, pe members of our museum who volunteer, uh, who were metal workers, who were machinists. We have an architect. Uh, nice. You know, so we have all kinds of different skills. We have Duke, who's uh, you know premier with the wood. He's a restoration specialist. <laughs> And uh, people can work alongside of them and learn learn stuff. I've learned stuff working alongside I'm them. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. It's great to have you back in the studio because it's been a while since we had you, you know, pre-COVID. Uh, now, let's mention one thing, too, because something that used to happen before was at school visits or where teachers would connect classes, right? Can you talk about how that used to work out? And, and how, if a teacher is interested in local history right down the road here, uh, they can find a way to bring some kids and arrange something? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we offer school field trips free of charge. Uh -huh. um, we have been very successful with those up until about a year before COVID hit. Uh -huh. And that's also when a lot of school budgets seem to be getting a little crunched. That's and true. one of the things that disappeared was money for them to take field trips. Yeah. Even though we don't charge anything, they got to pay for bus service and all that kind of jazz. That's right. Yeah. But before that happened, uh, one great example was uh, the uh, St. Joseph School mm. over here. I don't know if they're still operating, but anyway. I don't think so. But, yeah. But uh, they. Uh, they all, every year had a transportation module, apparently, where they talked about transportation with the kids. Right. They would bring the kids down to the railroad museum, and we would show them how the railroad part of transportation worked. Yeah. That was always good. And we had kids from Natchog come over and enjoy right. the day and all of that. Right. 
So I just mentioned it now, if anybody watching or maybe listening, uh, if you're involved with the teacher education, this is a great way to bring some history to life. Because one thing I want to do while we have a few minutes left is talk about how important this area used to be. You know, what's happened with COVID in so many ways are the supply side disruptions that are affecting simple things like food on shelves and parts in stores and things that we just took for granted. If you go back a little bit farther, the railroad was the only way you got that stuff before airplanes. That was the only way before roads. And here we are keeping a piece of it here. And that's kind of why you're so into this is that was the reality. You know, it's like living with horses today. Without horses, we wouldn't be alive today. We wouldn't have made it that's without correct. horses. We would not have made it. So, you know, that's why you're doing this. Well, you know, it's interesting that you mention that uh, because the railroads are still an important part of the supply chain. And in fact, I was discussing this with Wayne Norman just this morning. Uh, recently, I'd say the last six months, we have noticed an uptick in the amount of railroad traffic coming through Willimantic. Mm. And that tells us that the supply chain is easing up and things are coming back a little bit. Yep. So they're getting down to this level. In other that's words. right. So, you know, yep. what people see the railroads coming through Willimantic now, that's your supply chain. It's still yeah. a part, an important part yeah. of it. You know, it's that Paul Simon song, The Sound of a Train in the Distance. I love that tune because I love when it goes off because I hear it at home in my house. Okay. Like 520 or so. There's something around 530 on the you know, weekdays. You, usually, yes. Right? It's around right. that time. Yep. In the morning. Yep. Yeah. It's, a, yep. it's an incredible thing. But uh, where would people go from here? Would it primarily be towards New York? Would it be more towards Boston? What was the general direction when things grew out? Both directions. Oh. Willimantic was a hub. A big one. And they came from Boston to Willimantic and from Willimantic to New York and vice versa. Plus Willimantic to Hartford, to New Willimantic London. Willimantic to Hartford, New up, London. Up, up to, to, to Montreal. Yeah. So this this was a was one of the many railroad centers in eastern in, in Connecticut. Yep. And you know, forty or fifty trains a day. So it was it was a busy place. Do you think with the whole build back better and the effort to look at infrastructure for the future, this is gonna be important because railroads are still struggling. And right. sometimes people they forget the past because it's convenient and they don't worry about consequences till later, you know. How do you think the railroads are going to fit in with all the stresses for passengers as well as freight? Well, I can, I can give you some idea on that. Uh, it's not talked about much, but the funds that have been uh, allocated already uh, include a significant amount of money to improve infrastructure of the railroads. Now, that doesn't mean that the uh, politicians... Uh, care much about railroad history. I'm not sure they do, but they do care about the present condition of the railroads and what they're going to be in the future. And they are, in fact, making an investment in that. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear some encouraging news. Well, I want to thank you guys for being here today. We've had uh, Mark Granville. He's the treasurer this year and a past president. And also Duke York, one of the founding members. I wish you guys a great season ahead. And thank you for all the work you're doing with everybody on your team to get ready for May 7th. That's Saturday uh, from uh, 10 to 4. Also, check out their Facebook page and the website. It's Connecticut Eastern Railroad Museum. And we'll look forward to having you back in the summer, and we'll see how things go. Thanks, John. All right. Thank uh, you very much, John. A pleasure. A pleasure. <laughs> All righty, well, we're going to continue now. This is some audio that we recorded previously with Charlene Halcom from the Cultural Coalition. Uh, there's a special series of business trainings going on online uh, for artists and small businesses and nonprofits. And you can do it right from your home. It starts this Friday at, at 12 noon. So here's a few minutes with Charlene to give you an update. Um, well, we decided through meetings that I've been having with our constituents up here in the Northeast that um, there was a common theme going uh, that a lot of our our new members would benefit from, and older members too, mm -hmm. um, long longer standing members. Um, the first event is going to be on May fifth, and it's going to be a focus on nonprofits. The featured guest is going to be the Cultural Coalition's Funding Booster Program Coordinator, Jessica Memrosovic. Um, she's just great. She's, I recommend meeting with her to all of our clients that we meet that um, 
they're really looking for sustainability or growth, um, best practices. The three-part series evolved out of a desire to have um, to return to best practices or to establish best practices. So these are kind of good for anyone who is looking to either start something. It can be an individual artist. It can be somebody who's already a nonprofit. It can be a smaller organization. Or it could be a larger organization that just wants to take a little refresher. Um, we welcome everyone. So like I said, the, the first one on May 5th from noon to 1, it's going to be online through Zoom. And that's going to be our focus on nonprofits. Then on May 26th, also noon to 1 online through Zoom, uh, we're going to feature assets for artists. Uh, they are a group uh, with Mass Mocha in Massachusetts, but uh-huh. they do offer workshops and programming down in Connecticut as well. They are they just they put on fabulous workshops. I've attended several of them myself as a practicing artist, and um, I can't speak highly enough for them. So they are going to join us on the 26th for our focus on artists, and then on June 23rd, again noon to one online via Zoom so everyone can join. We're going to do a focus on creative businesses. And our featured guest then is going to be um, Wendy Vincent from the Women's Business Development Council of Eastern Connecticut. Um, so, you know, they're they're going to be looking at the creative businesses, how the arts um, can, I guess I should say, back to best practices. Um, right. I've I've heard from businesses that just want to go to the next level, but they're not quite sure how to get there. Like they've reached the ceiling where they feel they have, um, but what comes next? Or if they've just taken that leap, how do we sustain it? Um, and so, you know, I, I think personally, I think all of these three ser- three individual ones in the series would be great for anybody who wants to attend. They're open to everybody, but the information is going to be tailored for these three different subsects that we have. Well, you know, one of the things that makes me feel very positive about everything you're doing is that I know so many people were on the verge of getting something finally together, and then COVID hit. And so many things got shut down prematurely that they're coming back now, and they're trying to, you know, not reinvent the wheel and jump back in. And this is going to enable individuals or groups all over the region that are occasional guests here in the studio. Small groups can use this, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I would definitely recommend. Um, we in this region have a lot of very small organizations. Oftentimes there's not paid staff. It's just dedicated people who are That's trying right. to do something good. All volunteers. You know, so, exactly, all volunteers. And so big or small, I say we have something to offer you. So come on to our meetings. Um, and um, we're. I should say that In light of this, part of what we touched on was um, the idea of collaboration. Some of these smaller areas want to know um, one thing that COVID brought about was this Zoom and was a a desire to collaborate with others and reach out in different ways. And they, again, just could use a little information on how or how do we find others that want to collaborate. Um, And so because there is kind of this desire and this this want growing, um, the coalition is going to be doing a special event just focusing on collaboration. It's Collaboration 101, and that's going to be open to um, both the Northeast and the Southeast. So keep an eye on that. I believe that's going to be in May as well. That's really wonderful because that's the mm-hmm. thing. People often think, well, they're kind of limited with their little piece of the pie. But when you put mm-hmm. them together, you leverage a lot. And, exactly. and And it's kind of being forced in a way. But anyway, mm-hmm. I just want to mention a website. If you're listening right now mm-hmm. to Charlene Halcombe, she's the uh, Northeast coordinator for the coalition. Mm-hmm. Culturesect.org. Culture, S-E-C-T dot org is the main website for the whole organization. And then you can mm-hmm. go to the Northeast region and find out for people to stay in touch with you they mm-hmm. can uh, they can kind of register so that you know they're a practicing artist in our community and they can right. also get a newsletter to keep up to date could you talk about how that works absolutely so there's a monthly e-blast that goes out that goes to all of our members uh, over a thousand the first step is go to the website um, you can sign up to be either a southeast or a northeast member uh, if you go to the main menu you would just look for the tab that I'm going to focus on those in the northeast so um, it, I believe it's who do you serve. So look for the Northeast and then down maybe three-quarters of the page, you'll find a link where you can, one, register 
to become one of our members, and that will automatically sign you up for the newsletter. You'll get that monthly e-blast. Um, you'll also get specific targeted emails from me. So when I have a news update, I will send something out just to the Northeast region. Um, and also on that page are the three links for our upcoming session. So it's all right there for you. So sign up to be a member. You can sign up to um, attend all three or just one of our events that are upcoming. Um, I should also say that membership in our organization is 100% free. We offer this as a service. We are a regional organization for the state. Um, so there is no charge. There's, there's really no downside. So sign up. What a great way to close the conversation. There's no charge, and there's so many things to do, right? Yeah, exactly. And just like Charlene was saying, this is a regional support from the Connecticut Office for the Arts, and they have similar groups all over the state in different areas. But Charlene mm -hmm. covers our area here, especially in the Northeast. And we thank you very much for taking some time to be here, Charlene. I look forward to having you back, and we'll, and we'll just keep everybody posted as the summer comes ahead. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to, to have me on. Okay, so that's how we're going to wrap up this week's program for On the Home Front. My name is John Murphy. Thanks for sharing some of your time with me. We'll be expanding our program to, to about an hour beginning in August. And if you'd like to join me in the studio, if you're involved with the arts, small business, if you're an entrepreneur, or if you have a community organization and you want to get your information out, just use email and contact me. We'll have you on a future program right here. It's john at humanartsmedia.com. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week.